Welcome to the International Bariatric Club Hot Topics and Surgery webinar series. We are streaming live from the IBC studios in San Diego, California. I'm your host, Dr. Ariel Ortiz. Today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery is an exclusive event in collaboration with Zoom Video Communications and Facebook, and is organized by Dr. Harris Quaja, Director of IBC Global Education, and is supported by Advanced Medical Solutions, ConMed, and Bariatric News. This event will feature the living legend of bariatric surgery, Professor Walter Pores from the United States, who will give a presentation entitled, Who Would Have Thought It? An Operation Proves to Be the Most Effective Therapy for Adult Onset Diabetes, based on his seminal publication in the Annals of Surgery 25 years ago. I had a chance to chat with him recently. Let's listen in. When I was a medical student, uh, there were no loans. And so you had to work. And I worked for a guy who was pretty close to being crazy, but had been trained by, no by Fisher, a Nobel Prize winner. And one way or another, we found out that zinc was actually essential in not just for plants, but also for animals and for humans. And that led to a total change in animal husbandry. And so at that time, I worked in medical school at the same time at Cornell Ag School, and we increased first egg laying production by 45 days. We got broilers to market in six weeks instead of 10, and we were able to raise five pigs where it frequently took four. And that then led to a whole bunch of agricultural research, but that got me interested. So when I moved out here where land was cheap, we bought a number of farms and so we're serious farmers. We grow soybeans and corn and so on. If you look at the epidemiology of diabetes and obesity, so now one in every four Americans over 65 is a diabetic. Since I'm a farmer, and so the question is, are the ways we're treating the environment with heavy metals, organophosphates causing this? So we now have blood samples that we collected over seven years in six different states around the country. And we're working with the EPA to look for heavy metals and organophosphates in these serum samples. This live cast is streaming to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and IBC Instagram. Today's event will be moderated by Professor Manuel Galvao Neto, Director of IBC Innovations, and of course, Professor Tomas Rogula, founder of the IBC. I wanna welcome everyone again to another episode of Hot Topics in Surgery. I'm your host, Ariel Ortiz Lagardere, and this is International Bariatric Club, Oxford University, webinar series. We have a great program for you today. Let me start off by asking everyone to share this feed on your social media with your friends and colleagues. This is a good one. This is a historic one. We have none other than Professor Walter Pori's uh, historic landmark paper published 25 years ago, but I'm going to pass it on to our president and founder of International Bariatric Club, Oxford University, uh, Dr. Tomas Rogula so he can present our moderator today, Tomas. Hello, Ariel Hero, uh, my dear friends all over the world. Uh, this is a very special event. Professor Walter Porris uh, is one of the few examples of a single discovery that uh, made a huge impact of millions of, of people all over the world. Uh, I'm not aware of anything similar in, in the, in the uh, science of, of surgery with such a huge impact. 
So I'm also very honored to know Professor Polis personally very well. <clears throat> I visited him on, on many occasions in his uh, fantastic lab. And I know uh, how humble he is uh, and how great uh, scientist and surgeon uh, Professor Polis is. It's a really great uh, pleasure and honor to have uh, Professor Polis with us uh, tonight. I want to pass it to uh, Professor Manuel Galvao Neto from Brazil uh, to carry on today's program. So thank you very much, Tom. And uh, to say that uh, Professor Walter Porris, you have been always an inspiration to me. Uh, remember so many chats we have and uh, how humble we used to eat to be uh, close to you and listen to your stories. And uh, I'm a, you know, I'm a big fan of your work. I have to tell you that personally, and I'll tell that again and again and again. So you are inspire us to get here to that point that we can all discuss about metabolic surgery. Who will you thought that your discovery will lead us to understand that the type 2 diabetes is not a pancreatic disease by far, but is indeed related to a lot with the bowel. So, Professor Walter Porris, please come into the stage and enlighten us. Um, let me share my screen with you. And uh, let me start this thing properly. I hope that you can see these slides well at this point. Yes, yes we, we can. can. Okay. Good. Well, uh, first of all, let me thank you for this uh, really undeserved introduction, because frankly, this is a pretty simple kind of thing that any of you would have interpreted the same way. Uh, the real thing is, let me tell you a story. I was a pediatric surgeon, that means operating on little people, at Case Western Reserve when I got this invitation to help start a new medical school in a very underserved area in the United States in Eastern North Carolina. And this was the entire tertiary hospital for 1.4 million people in the region. And since I was chief of surgery, I was also the head of the emergency department. And you can see that in its entirety. Here, one little operating table and a cot. So we started. And we started to build a medical building. And a dean came in and said, as only deans can, they said, really sorry, but the funds I promised were used in the building. So let's all work on one research target. Just think, we're brand new medical school and already an institute. And I'm gonna leave the room and the, the whole faculty, which is about 12 people, I'm gonna let you decide what this common research objective will be. And he walked out and they said, Let's focus on obesity. I thought these were my friends. So chair of medicine said, we'll study diets and exercise, behavioral modification. Everybody was thrilled, except what in the world was a chair of surgery going to do about obesity, especially when you're a pediatric surgeon who like premature babies. But actually, it was a very good decision because obesity is really not about weight. Obesity is about all these other comorbidities that make up the metabolic syndrome, which is today the most costly disease in the United States and probably in the Western world. So we went on and to show you the, how much it meant in this particular region, this is obesity in the United States. This is the level of obesity in North Carolina. And in Eastern North Carolina, it's this, or four times as high as it is in the rest of the United States. So it turned out to be a very good choice. Well, research quickly showed that 
there had been an, multiple attempts, especially with an operation called the intestinal bypass to produce weight loss. In this operation, most of the small bowel was detoured into the sigmoid colon. And as you can read here, there were many deaths, many complications. And one of the really dark spots in the history of surgery is that 30,000 of these operations were performed in the United States, high mortality rate until they were finally stopped. So we were sort of pretty reluctant, but we read this paper by Ed Mason at the University of Iowa, who said, you know what, we can cut the stomach in half and root the contents into small bowel. And he said he did several and the patients lost weight. So he said, why don't we do that? And by that time, my entire faculty consisted of two other people. One was Charles Robb, who had been my chair at the University of Rochester, retired. And he had the history of having taken care of Winston Churchill and also helped take the lung out of King George. And Adrianus Van Rij was a postdoc in trace metal chemistry. He's now the chief of surgery in Dunedin. So there are just the three of us. And we said, why don't we try this? And we did. And they certainly lost weight. But the reason they lost weight was because the bile came up, spilled into the stomach, and they vomited bile. So obviously, this was not the answer. And the right thing to do was pretty apparent would be to put in a rule on why, which is a way of running, making sure that peristalsis prevents the bile from coming back. In doing so, notice we made a, a whole different design. And you see how the bile goes down here. And we call this the Greenville Gastric Bypass. It's basically the bypass as it's still done around the world. But the important part was that Charles Robb said, let's not fall into the same problem as intestinal bypass. Let's standardize this operation and we have to follow every single patient. So we standardized it to 30 milliliter gastric pouch. That's the size of your thumb. A 10 millimeter anastomosis. That's the diameter of a regular pencil. A 60 centimeter elementary loop. And we were able to follow these patients from 1980 to 1998 with a 95% follow-up. And I'm going to give you the results in 147 people that were followed during that time, a 16-year cohort. And as you can see, they had an additional weight, mean weight of 317. And 16 years later, 211, and again, that's a weight loss of 33%. We were very pleased when Shower, just a five-year follow-up, had almost similar figures at 33.4%. To really make sure that this wasn't just a small group of people, we then got a grant from the NIH in which we studied 2,400 patients in the NIH with five other centers, and we had a 92% follow-up. And as you can see, here are the numbers, there's quite a bit of difference, but notice that not a single patient, not a single patient uh, regained their original weight. And furthermore, 97.8% maintained over 10% weight loss, and that showed that there was a mean durable weight loss as indicated with about a third of their original weight. That then led to an interesting, we were quite pleased we got some weight loss and we had this fiery endocrinologist from Spain, really terrible temper. And he said that he had a very brittle diabetic who was severely obese, would we consider doing a gastric bypass? And so I said, yes, we'll do it. But you got to know that the glucose may be very difficult to control afterwards because that's been our experience when we did colectomies and other operations. And so 
We did the first patient. We were all ready to take care of him. And the glucose was normal. And the second patient and the third patient, all the same. So I had the terrible idea of asking Jose if he knew how to diagnose diabetes. He got so angry, I thought he was going to hit me. But he did send me a fourth patient with the same results. And then he said, well, obviously, it's a new medical school. And we got idiots here who don't, just don't know how to measure sugar. Well, we went to the lab. And of course, they showed they could do it. So here's the sixth patient, or the fifth patient. Notice he had a glucose of 495 in spite of 90 units of insulin before I operated. I operated on it with insulin running. And the next day, the entire requirement, still on sliding scale, was only eight units. And notice again, six days after surgery, six days, was the last time in her life that she ever required any treatment for diabetes. The diabetes cleared within a week. So we followed a number of these patients. So at 9.2 years, we had 165 diabetic patients and 165 that were impaired. And notice that at 9.2 years, 83% still had normal glucose levels. And of course, the impaired, 99%. But notice that 83%, four out of five patients, were still, had still had normal blood sugars. And then we were pleased when Shower, a couple of years later, with a five-year experience, but more patients had exactly the same number. That's quite rare in clinical trials. Of course, nobody believed us. I mean, the most common thing we heard was, this is really interesting, but the idea that diabetes is curable by intestinal surgery is frankly bizarre. And they then said, okay, if you're going to want us to believe you, you're going to have to do prospective, randomized trials, funded and monitored by the NIH, and published in respected journals. Let me point out that there's no treat, no medical treatment for diabetes that has actually met those requirements. And so this is a pretty good journal. And notice also that this study, this by Shower, was prospective and it's against intensive medical therapy. And here are the results. This is the number of medications for diabetes and the ones treated medically. Notice they were still on the same, actually an increase in medical therapy, and notice those in gastric bypass were totally off all medications. A similar report was published by Mingroni, and then another one in JAMA, also a pretty good journal. And you'll see over here, again, a marked reduction in glucose in these patients. And what you really care about is long-term results. This is a patient that's picture I took about a year ago, who had no diabetes for 33 years. And here's another one. She, her diabetes has now been gone for 32 years. Which then means, if you put all this together, that diabetes is not a progressive, untreatable disease. It can be reversed. But while we were all happy with those results, my resident, Dr. McDowell, who's now a very respected surgeon here in town, said, okay, big deal, you correct the glucose values, but does it really matter in terms of health? It's really a very profound question. And of course, since I was a chair, I told him to go find out. And so he checked on 232 diabetics that had been scheduled for surgery, 154 had it, had the surgery, but the other 78 couldn't get insurance. And there were a few who simply changed their mind and said, doc, my doctor recommends I don't have it. In the group that had it, their long-term mortality at nine years was 1% per year. But in the ones who didn't have it at 6.2 years, 
their mortality was 4.6%. That meant there was a reduction in mortality by 78%. Well, I don't know about you, but I certainly wouldn't believe that. But then a week later, after McDonald brought me this data, Canada came out, Chris Du from Canada, and pointed out a reduction in mortality of 89%. And that was quickly followed by a report from Sweden, another from the VA, and still another from Norway. And that meant for the first time, we're not just reducing glucose levels, we're reducing the mortality of diabetes. And then the other curious observation, it wasn't just that obesity and diabetes were uh, corrected, also hypertension, dyslipidemias, NASH, today the most common cause of cirrhosis. Then heart disease, the heart would actually undergo geometric changes. There were improvements in cognition, quality of life, and even in nephropathy and neuropathy would be reversed. We had patients on renal failure who improved. And notice there were actual reductions in carotid intima thicknesses. And the most interesting one is down here in cancer, a reduced risk for cancer, which is again shown in this paper from Canada. Look at the reduction in the prevalence of cancer within five years, as well as these other factors. Well, this meant that we're not really talking about one entity of diabetes or obesity. So we did a literature search, a meta-analysis of all of these various diseases that responded to bariatric surgery. And we found that all of them were associated with insulin levels all were associated with high insulin levels, which meant then that diabetes is not a unique disease and hypertension, a unique disease and dyslipidemias. They're all expressions of the metabolic syndrome, just as in tuberculosis, you get problems in the brain, the kidney, the bone, and so on. So high insulin levels are the common denominator in the metabolic syndrome. So we measured that, and here these are diabetic patients, these are patients, and they're fasting insulin levels. It's a normal patient. Notice that in the obese patient, it's three times as high. This is impaired glucose tolerance, early diabetes, and late diabetes. And notice in advanced diabetes, the level can be nine times normal, nine times normal, not 9% or 90%. We're talking about 900%. So they're very hyperinsulinemic. And so we looked at this a little more closely with a series. These are just normal glucose tolerance tests. And the white is glucose and the black is insulin. And in a lean person, it takes this much insulin to keep the glucose levels at that point. In the obese, it takes a lot more insulin to keep the glucose normal, and we call that insulin resistance. And everyone knows this. And then, of course, there was a statement, well, then, you know, they're not able to secrete insulin as much. That's why we have to give them this. And yet, look at this. It is true. There is a decrease in insulin secretion as the disease progresses, maximum insulin secretion. But even so, their maximum insulin secretion in advanced diabetes is still more than twice normal. What is overlooked is just look at these black dots and look at this. This is basal insulin secretion. And this is when patients are asleep. Remember, this is fasting. And when they're on a diet, and you'll notice that patients who are on with advanced diabetes actually have a higher insulin level when they're asleep and not eating the normal persons are after food. The question then is, uh, why are we treating patients with insulin, which is a mitogen, causes cancer, and a hormone that stores fat? So let's look briefly at what's going on. Let's look at diabetes again. In a fasting patient, you can see 
you all know glucose goes up and you know because of that insulin goes up but what has not been mentioned is that lactate goes up and lactate is the black smoke coming out of the metabolic engine that means that the black that this lipids and glucose are not appropriately oxidized and so we tested this and we looked at lactate levels in patients who had undergone bariatric surgery and so when a patient who's obese and diabetic is challenged with glucose and an insulin load, they can't handle it and they just put out lots of lactate. But after surgery, at both at one month and three months, this is totally corrected. So let's look at this again. Let's look at fasting metabolism in a lean subject. So food comes into the stomach and with the help of insulin, Glucose is absorbed into the liver, where it can be stored as glycogen, but most of it goes to the main customer, which is the muscle, and there it enters the typical TCA circle to be moved into energy. And if you're running really fast, some of that can't be metabolized and comes back as lactate to be processed again by the liver and then returned, and that's, of course, called the Cori cycle. So now let's look at what goes on in a patient with diabetes. You're already familiar with all of this and this, and notice now what happens in the diabetic. Lactate comes back in very large amounts. And that can be best explained if there's a block before it enters the TCA cycle and another block down here, of course, in the same process. And now it starts to make sense because now glucose goes up because it can't be processed. Insulin goes up because the glucose is up and the lactate goes up because it, there's too much around and the liver doesn't know what to do with it. Or to put it another way, glucose goes pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, fatty acids. This is the normal way to enter the TCA cycle. And if there's too much to process, it goes to lactate, goes into the liver as I just showed you. But what happens in diabetes? Obviously, something must be coming from the gut. And that actually limits this process. And you'll see now that that ends up as too much pyruvate, ends up as lactate, that increases the lactate, insulin, and glucose, and the liver has nothing to do but to make it into lipids and even more glucose. This is the basic lesion of diabetes. So in conclusion, type two diabetes is not an isolated unique disease. It's only one expression of a far broader metabolic syndrome that is caused by a toxic signal from the foregut that interferes with the TCA cycle, the mitochondrial membrane, and metabolic surgery reverses this defect by altering foregut signaling. At the use of insulin for treatment of diabetes really needs serious review. So thank you again. I hope you come and see us in wonderful North Carolina. Thank you. Oh, that was fantastic presentation, uh, Professor Porris. Uh, so this is uh, something that uh, changed the, the phase of current uh, surgery. And I remember my days when I was a fellow, uh, which was not that uh, long time ago, but uh, still uh, I was told that, uh, listen, Tom, you know, diabetes, yes, it's getting a little better, but because uh, patients don't eat anything or they have little stomach, uh, it's kind of expected. Don't worry about it, uh, it will come back again. Uh, so um, if from this perspective, I was wondering um, uh, how um, can we predict the long-term outcome of, of metabolic surgery? Is there any way, for example, uh, you mentioned that uh, those metabolic um, um, effects of chlorobates uh, can you predict somehow on metabolic level if one patient uh, can uh, improve in long term or not? Well, actually, 
there's some very interesting data. Uh, we all know that the earlier the surgery is done, the more likely it is to be successful, similar to what happens with cancer, heart disease, and so on. Earlier therapy before these organs get damaged makes a difference. We also know that females respond better than males. Caucasians respond better than Asians. Asians respond better than African-Americans. Uh, we also know that young people respond better than the elderly, than older patients. But we're interested right now in looking at lactate as a potential indicator of the severity of metabolic disease and seeing if that very simple test, which you can do with a finger stick, could predict the outcomes of metabolic surgery. So from this perspective, uh, you think we're ready for um, using that uh, simple blood work, as I mentioned, routinely on every patient coming for, for metabolic surgery? Well, we'd, we'd like that. So we're, uh, we're really testing the thesis. It's really interesting that in acute care, the care of trauma patients, burn patients, and so on, we've learned that a high lactate indicates a high mortality level, and that when the lactate gets better, the patients are getting better. It's probably one of the most useful and widely used tests. It's interesting in chronic disease, it has just not been used much. But there's several old papers uh, in the literature showing where people have shown that in diabetes and other areas of metabolic syndrome, lactate can be a really useful indicator. Now, we have some unpublished work, which is quite interesting. We took some athletes, uh, these are women. Uh, we have quite an athletic team here at East Carolina University. And we measured the lactate levels of these young women, really active women. And it turned out that they were not a straight line. We were looking for normal levels, but some of those young women actually had elevated lactate levels. And then when we asked them informally about their family histories, those with high lactate levels had family histories of diabetes and hypertension and so on. Now, the reason we did it informally is because we didn't get the IRB approval to ask that question in the first place. So we're gonna repeat that and maybe you guys would like to repeat that with us. But if this is true, that, uh, that we're already marked with a high, an elevated lactate level at a young age, maybe you could identify the people who will get metabolic syndrome and maybe do even preventive gastric surgery. Wonderful. So I have a question. Oh. Yep. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Manuel, please. I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Walter, uh, yeah. I just love, I am delighted when someone starts a presentation like, let me tell you a history. It <laughs> means so much because the history is the one who is speaking to us. <laughs> and uh, tell us more, more about your history. And um, I'm very, very curious because uh, behind the lines, behind the slides, uh, what what were the barrier, the struggles that you find yourself personally to get us to that point when you tell your history, you're telling the history of the surgery for diabetes that everybody respects nowadays. And what was what you have encountered in terms of goals of have to surpass, funny histories like uh, how you, you you told some, but uh, like you are in the podium or you are demonstrating, and now what you see in Congress that you have uh, not just sessions but societies dedicated to metabolic surgeries. So I really am curious uh, to know more about this history. Well, that, well, the funniest story is, is even convincing people that this might make any kind of sense. And to schedule that surgery now, if you're the chief of surgery, people won't confront you directly, but behind your back, you're saying, you know, maybe it's time to get another chief of surgery. He wants to operate on these fat people. And then we actually did the first case 
and I couldn't get that loop of jejunum to go up to the stomach. No matter how I tried, the damn thing wouldn't go. And finally I said, you piss, what are you going to do now? You've already made this little gastric pouch. You, you can't pull the stuff up. And I finally said, oh, God, please help me. And for some reason, and I'm not very religious, for some reason that worked. And suddenly it came up and I was able to sew it in. Uh, it's, it was a really interesting time. Uh, Ariel, uh, can you uh, make your comment now? Yes. Uh, so yesterday we were having this great discussion, uh, like uh, Manuel says, about history. And, and you were explaining how you ended up in a completely different field, uh, which is uh, farming. But then it would seem that so many years later, this ability to understand what's going on with our food from the uh, uh, from the production standpoint, from agro industry standpoint, has that given you a broader sense of view of what the problem is in metabolic disease? You were talking a little bit about toxins, the toxicity of, of production of food, etc. So you have kind of several points of view, not just from a physician standpoint, but from the uh, production or agriculture as well. Yeah, I, I think we owe the world a better explanation. We've watched now between 1999 to 2009, a doubling of the prevalence of diabetes and obesity. And then between 2009 and now, 19, we have another doubling. So it's a major epidemic. I mean, if somebody said to you that HIV had doubled 10 years before and doubled again, we'd, we'd all be we would all be in a panic. So this is sort of accepted. And then we also have this thing because of a great bias against the obese that obviously they're eating too much, it's McDonald's fault and so on and so forth. But when you look at the map of the distribution of diabetes, it's not that of the fast food restaurants or any race or poverty uh, or any national origin or anything else or occupation. It's very regional in the way that crops are regional. And now it looks, at least to me, that the distribution is very similar to that of a fungicide we use for uh, soybean rust, which is a, a, a plant disease. And so I think it's time that we started looking at the obese and see what kind of a burden do they have in terms of organophosphates, heavy metals, and other toxins. And uh, Professor Walter, I have one more for you here. Uh, it is, we have it. We have the hammer. We don't have the vaccine. We have the treatment for the disease once the disease appears. Why we still on the 2% penetration rate, meaning that the people that qualify to have the surgery don't have it. I, I can narrow that. So maybe a little bit less for metabolic surgery. Uh, can you give us some uh, wise pills? Because uh, we think we have it, but uh, we are all on the, these trials. We are all in this Congress. We are on the television. Uh, I know that the prejudice that everybody evaluates uh, obesity, but it's okay. That's not obesity anymore. Now it's diabetes. So it's considered a serious disease by uh, all of the ones who have had prejudice of, against obesity. Give us, because this is why we're here, we wanted to hear you, give us some pearls of wisdom on how we can get more on that. Uh, first of all, I'm short on pearls of wisdom. <laughs> but it's interesting, we, we surveyed uh, patients, physicians, and insurance carriers about this very same question, because right now in the United States, 
we just looked at the data, the, the percentage of people undergoing bariatric surgery is even less than it was five years ago. Uh, we're stuck at about 1% or less. So it's interesting. The first thing we did is we surveyed physicians and most physicians don't believe it. They're very misinformed. Their feeling is one, that this is extremely dangerous surgery, even though the mortality rate from surgery is now uh, 0.2%. It's safer than a routine cholecystectomy. So they don't believe that. Secondly, they absolutely are convinced that the weight will come back in almost all of these patients. And three days, they also say all the diabetes comes back. And when you give them the data, they simply don't believe it. So even in, in Greenville, North Carolina, many of the physicians say, oh yeah, we, we understand, but they're not referring patients. Then if you look at the insurance companies, and I was on the board of Blue Cross Blue Shield for a while, they're terrified that all these fat people, after all, this is all just about fat, is actually uh, gonna cost too much. But about three months ago, I was asked to be a consultant to United Healthcare, which is the United States' largest insurance company. And it turned out that the average care of a diabetic patient is $18,000 a year with the new medications. Also, the one-time cost for bariatric surgery in the United States is $17,600. And suddenly they're beginning to see that it might make sense to get these people the operations. But this is just beginning and we're just experimental side of that insurance company. And then finally, when you talk to patients, it seems that almost every patient knows somebody who didn't do well. You can't track it down. And if you look at Oprah on the, on the TV, she talks about one or two friends of hers that didn't do well. So I think we got a real problem in educating the public. I'm not even sure our friends in orthopedics and ENT believe us. Yeah, this is this is. I have to. Sure. I have to tell you though. Know, I, I moved uh, from the United States after 21 years back to Europe, and I, I have to tell you the um, the overall uh, uh, awareness of metabolic surgery is not bad at all. I mean, we have uh, quite significant. A uh, number of patients referred by uh, endocrinologists and cardiologists. We had a meeting with cardiologists today, and they are very interested in, in skin cases. I think one of the problem in, in America is probably insurance system, which uh, I would say it's quite tough. Uh, in countries like like European countries, where most of them have government uh, insurance system, I think it's a little bit easier uh, to get patients uh, referred. Um, I want to pass uh, to Ariel with uh, some specific comments regarding procedures like sleeve gastrectomy. One of the uh, viewers from our IBC website was asking about sleeve gastrectomy. Ariel, can you pass the question? So, so the question is related to HbA1c and HbA1c levels uh, and qualifying for surgery or not. But I want to back up and use what Professor Poris is explaining about we, we suspect that there's an environmental factor that's causing uh, the diabetes. So what we, we have worked on for several thousand patients uh, in weight loss surgery, in our weight loss surgery center is prepping these patients from, from a nutritional perspective. And what we do is we get them on a pre-surgical program where they're eating as plain and simple as possible, which means uh, no processed foods, preferably organic in origin uh, to lower the toxicity. And number three, we lower the carb, uh, sim especially simple carbs, but the 
carbohydrate level uh, as a macronutrient down to 10%. So we're trying to diminish the carb load uh, and we're trying to diminish the toxicity load. And we've seen spectacular results uh, in, in our series where patients are actually normal glycemic after two to three weeks with a simple program like that. In fact, they are uh, off certain medications and we've had several patients that they're not using insulin because they're now hypoglycemic with, uh, as they are not eating any uh, carbohydrates. So when we prep our patients for surgery, be it gastric sleeve or any other type of procedure, it takes two to three weeks literally to change their metabolic uh, profile. And a question to Professor Pori's, as you were mentioning, uh, how uh, the whole biochemistry of diabetes is, wouldn't it seem uh, counterintuitive or, or, or illogical in a disease of high insulin to use insulin to treat patients? Are, are we, is, is our normal treatment globally or our standard treatment, is it wrong? What you touched on, you touched on several things. The first one is uh, that a very good diet, carefully protected, without any question, does very well. Uh, the problem is people can't can't maintain it, and but there's no question that it does that. Uh, I. In terms of gastric sleeve versus the gastric bypass, which is quite interesting, because they're totally two, they're two totally different operations. Totally. Frankly, if you really look at all the data, the results are just about the same. Which then suggests maybe we're talking about some kind of signaling mechanism, a reset button in the gut, as if it were a regular organ. And so let me digress a minute. Uh, if, you, if you fiddle around and read Nature magazine once in a while, you re I read this article while doing that about pythons. <laughs> I know we're really way off the subject, but a python will eat only about every three to four months. And when it doesn't eat, its gut becomes the size of your little finger and just a little hollow tube, very thin walled. And then when it gets hungry, it can eat an entire deer, antlers and all with hoofs and digest it in six days. So the question is, what happens here where the gut gets totally reset? And is it possible that what we have, as similar to bears that hibernate, are we setting our gut for starvation. In other words, we save the fat, we do all these various things, and then you become, get the metabolic syndrome. And maybe what we're really doing with surgery is resetting the gut into a different, a normal mode. Just an interesting thought. So we're trying to look at working with pythons. You can buy a python that weighs only one kilogram. And we're thinking about feeding one python getting the blood from that python and giving it to a starving python and seeing what happens to the gut. Is there a signal to reset? Okay. But your other question, repeat your other question again. Uh, the, the, and, and the question goes to uh, the insulin levels in a disease of high yeah. insulin, be it the but cause. There's, yeah. well, there's really, there's, there are really good data about that. There's a paper by Curry uh, done in the UK, in which he clearly showed that patients in whom insulin is added to oral drugs, this is now stratified by HB1AC levels, that they have a much higher mortality, three times as high mortality when insulin is added. I think the biggest thing we could do is educate the public. One is don't use insulin. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes are not the same. 
And number two is, these are now diseases that can be managed with an operation that takes an hour and you can go home one or two days later. With the safety, with the danger that's only twice as bad as a normal delivery. That's pretty good. Thank you. If I, if I can if I can comment uh, because uh, what uh, what I really pay attention uh, when when you present your uh, your slides was you you said that diabetes is uh, just uh, one piece of the puzzle. Uh, so it, it, it sounds like it 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 might not necessarily be a stand alone disease as we used to uh, think. But maybe it's uh, it's one of the um, faces of uh, a, a one big problem. Do you think, Professor Porris, that um, cancers or oncological problems are within the same kind of group of problems? Can we look at those things like diabetes, cancer, uh, and metabolic syndrome? from one perspective. Is it the same disease, maybe? Um, that's quite a, that's a very large question, but so I can only speculate. But it's interesting that one of the real uh, aspects of obesity is inflammation. Um, um, so the adipocytes get full, they become partly anoxic as they're stretched, and what they send out inflammatory cytokines. And we've already learned that inflammation, no matter how it appears, can cause cancer. And this may be the explanation why patients who are obese have a significantly higher rate of, of cancer. So I think there's probably some relationship, but that's another area that really needs to be explored. So uh, yes, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, regarding um, oncological risks, I have another question that comes from my uh, home university, which is in Krakow, Poland, University, Agron University. The question is uh, about uh, the gastric remnant, because in countries like, like Poland and other places, the um, uh, prevalence of gastric cancer is quite significant. So my colleagues are asking uh, about the uh, oncological risks uh, uh, concerning that, that remnant. Uh, do you have any, any advice for countries like, like Poland, Japan, or even Brazil, I think? Should we remove that, that remnant maybe? Well, it's an interesting question because there have been some reports of gastric cancer, but they're really very few. And when you do that, then of course you increase the danger of that operation significantly because now you're doing a total, literally a total gastrectomy. So I, I can't answer that question. Um, and I don't know whether you wipe that out totally if you do a gastric sleeve, because you're not, you're really not changing anything at all. But I think that's an area that needs to be watched. You're dead. totally right. But again, this is my, my feeling. There's absolutely no, I have no data to support. Uh, but from what I observe here for the last you know, several months I'm in Poland, uh, I never heard about any patient after gastric bypass coming to us with can gastric cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, otherwise, we see quite a few patients coming with gastric cancer. Some of them are quite obese at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it might sound like there is some protective uh, mechanism against uh, cancer, including that remnant, maybe. I, again, this, this is my, my pure opinion. I have absolutely no data to support, but that, that's what I see. But you're in a wonderful position to study that. Correct. Yeah, that's right. terrific. That's right. Um, Manuel, you, you live in a country with quite significant number of, of gastric cancer and you as endoscopies, I see some of them, right? Uh, how, 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 do you, how do you feel it about? Well, we don't, you know what? It's interesting. We don't have that many. We right. have the number that they have in Japan or the Asian countries. And um, 
it's one of our much less common diseases here, at least in Eastern North Carolina. Right. I want to specifically answering that, uh, Tom. Uh, it seems to me that the bypass protects the stomach from cancer uh, statistically. So if we analyze in Brazil the population that get a gastric bypass, the gas cancer levels is significantly lower. And that's uh, one of the publications uh, here in Brazil significantly lower than the average population. So I can tell you if you wanted to protect your patient to a gastric cancer to a bypass, sir. Huh, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that. Another question, if, if I can come in yeah. again, because yeah. this, is, this is quite, uh, quite exciting uh, area. Uh, again, I'm very biased by oncological surgery now because of my environment here. But uh, it would be very interesting to look at, at other cancers like colon cancer, for example, which is quite, quite significant here in Europe, uh, as well as in the United States. Uh, if that can be spread into other cancers as well. There is some data. Uh, uh, but uh, are you aware of any, any, any studies or any, any data that I look at in terms of colon cancer. Well, there's, yeah, Adams, uh, Adams and Crystal both have reported a sharp reduction in cancers. And the cancers are interesting because you say, oh, well, obviously ovarian, uterine, prostate, you say, oh, well, that makes sense. But then there's also a reduction in colon cancer. And I don't know why. That doesn't make sense to me. It may again be there's a different kind of food and the microbiome. So some people have looked at the microbiome and it changes right after bariatric surgery, but a year later it's exactly what it was before the surgery. And right. it's 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 really interesting how little we know, which means we all got job security. So Manuel, you, you are a very busy endoscopist and you, you see thousands of people with, with uh, different kinds of problems. How do you see uh, patients after gastric bypass in terms of, for example, uh, uh, polyps or other lesions um, from, from colonoscopy perspective? Is there any, any, any difference that you might tell just out of your mind without any, any supportive data? as endoscopy, so gastroenterology, Manuel. Uh, so uh, statistically, obese patients, they have more colon cancer. Uh, so you're reducing significantly the weight. So hypothetically, those patients should have less cancer, but the studies done, uh, it seems that the impact on the colon cancer rate after bariatric surgery, it is not, as high as we expected, meaning that when you have this polyp and you have the alteration that uh, will lead to a future colon cancer is there. So the reduction of the weight, not that important. One thing to take in consideration for you both is that uh, it's much difficult to do a colonoscopy in an obese patient. Obese, obese and morbid obese patients, they come less to be screening for a lot of reasons. So it's the same as uh, I'm thinking why obese women has more uh, uterine cancer. They have it because you cannot see it. They have it because they, can, they don't come. So those things we don't take in consideration. I think that's uh, maybe Professor Walter can comment on that. It's, I think it's a major issue on those kinds of cancer in obese or morbid obese patients. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And it's even worse in the United States because, it, because of insurance. Uh, our insurance problem is terrible. Uh, we, especially in an area like ours, in a state that did not expand Medicaid, we have literally hundreds of thousands of people who don't get adequate health care because of a lack of insurance, and they certainly don't get endoscopies. It's tragic. I have a, one more question, which actually we, we kind of touch upon a little bit, but one of our uh, website viewer, uh, her name is Susan, 
uh, was asking quite important question. Uh, is it safe to operate on very diabetic patients in terms of very high hemoglobin A1C, like say for example, 10, 12 or 15. We have patients here with a hemoglobin like 16 or 20. Is, yeah. is, it, is it really safe? Is there any, any data uh, supporting uh, operating on this kind of patient? Well, not only, as a matter of fact, there's excellent data. And the data is that if you take all comers, and that includes, we have a number of patients with high HV1AC just as you do, the mortality rate is still 0.2%. And that, that's 10 times safer than cardiac surgery. Uh, so the answer is absolutely safe. Even with this high initial hemoglobin A1C, should we, yeah. should we reduce it at, at any, any cost or just go ahead and operate? Well, um, one of the things that's really made a difference when we started bariatric surgery, we were impeded by the really big fatty livers. Uh, they were huge. They would even break sometimes with a, with a uh, elevator, some, any kind of retractor. And then we started in where for two weeks, we sharply reduced their intake. Uh, we give them a product called OptiFast, but the only reason for that is it's, it's a really good high protein, low calorie solution. We do that for two weeks and the liver becomes normal. And at the same time, the HB1ACs drop as well. So I think the way to do that is to provide them with a nutritional drink, sharply reduce their calories and, to, and to get better. We've not had trouble with high HB1ACs and neither of you. Yeah, and yes, and one of the things that actually supports uh, surgery even in a very high HbA1c is that there's a lot of studies now that that show that there is no difference with normal insulin therapy and extreme insulin therapy. In fact, there's a higher mortality rate if you're controlling those HbA1cs, uh, and without without surgery, obviously, but with surgery, you're correcting them naturally because you're diminishing the intake, especially if you're diminishing the carb intake early on. There is one, one more comment uh, from uh, here, also from, from uh, my university. Um, this is regarding some connections between metabolic uh, syndrome uh, and immunology, um, in, especially in regards to uh, increased risk of developing a colon or any cancer. Are you aware, Professor Paulis, of any, any type of link between um, immunology, I think chronic inflammatory state, diabetes, and obesity? Well, we need to explore that. That's a really important question. But well, we already know that uh, severely obese people are severely immunosuppressed. Uh, they just don't respond well. And so they're much more likely to get in trouble with a COVID virus, for example. Mortality is higher in patients who are obese. So uh, I think this is really worth studying. Uh, and the question is, how do they respond to transplants? because we do a lot of transplants here. So we're now looking at that question in patients who are immunosuppressed, do transplants do better? But it appears that they doesn't because they're overall more sick. Uh, it's a, it's a, you touched on a very important part. Uh, it sounds like, you know, it's a very exciting field of research uh, yeah. with a lot of more questions and answers. Uh, so I'm, I'm really grateful for, for your great input into, into this area, which is still uh, not explored uh, enough. Ariel, I want to pass it to you. Ariel? Well, uh, Manuel, if you have any uh, final comments. No, I just wanted to uh, thank Professor Walters once more. Uh, it's really delightful, pleasure and honor that's something I'll put on my resume that I have been here today 
with you, Professor. Thank you very much. Heartful. <laughs> you guys got to realize, one, I'm not fancy. I'm a farmer in a little in a little rural town, and I just have to be lucky to have people around me who are a lot smarter than I am. So it it will go from a plumber like me to a farmer. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's an incredible pleasure and an honor to have you, Professor Walter. It's, uh, it was wonderful to have you. Hopefully, we can have you in the near future when you discover the exact molecule, molecule that's causing uh, the diabetes pandemic, and we can move on to greater things even, even after that. In the meantime, I want to thank uh, Manuel Galvao uh, for moderating, uh, Professor Tom Rogula, our, our president and founder. And of course, I want to invite everyone to the event of May 19th, where we will be looking at thinking outside the box, our healthcare professionals uh, encountering this COVID-19 pandemic. And we will, we will be talking uh, about topics such as when to restart uh, surgeries, uh, gastrointestinal uh, presentation of COVID-19 by Eduardo Greco from Brazil. Our own Manuel Galvao will be talking about uh, managing general and bariatric surgical emergencies in the era of COVID-19. Uh, and of course, robotics, which is the hot topics. And we will have Gabriela Maldonado from Mexico and our good friend will be speaking from UCSD, Santiago Jorgen, with a great panel of experts. Uh, great panel of experts. I wanna thank again, everyone watching today. Please share these feeds to your friends and colleagues. And remember, you can always go to ibcclub.org for past and future upcoming events. I wanna thank everyone again for watching. Stay home, stay safe, and God bless.